How would you define life? I mean, I don't know if any of you here want to just do one more crack at this and then we'll move on to something else, but Chris, the question I asked you before, why don't you have to define it if you're going some to, to some other planet to look for it? How do you know what you're looking for? I don't think we need to define it in order to be able to find it. Uh, I think, as Lee said, we can recognize it by the molecules it leaves behind. We don't need a definition, and I don't think a definition will be forthcoming. And you might take the view that we'll only get a good definition when we have more than one example on which to study. So I think the whole debate about a definition is a, is a, is a mistake. Let's just go out and look for it. All right. So, so. Uh, Roger. So Roger? why did you call this thing what is well, life, Lawrence? What well, because well, well, it's a good question. But I think, in fact, it could change. For example, let me throw it in a completely different direction. When computers become conscious, which they will, um, my Mac is far closer than the PC. Uh, the, the, um, uh, will we call them life? And I think we, and they'll object if we don't. I suspect. Yeah. Call them. I mean, so, so, I think, so I think the definition of life is a floating, is a, is a, is a moving target. All right. So, so Paul, you, I asked you before the break. Speak to this notion as well. Yeah. That, that people have actually written papers suggesting that there might be life as we don't know it actually lurking around on the planet. We just even don't realize that. Uh, yeah, that uh, was the idea I was trying to develop, that we can't be sure that all life on Earth is the same life. And after all, what we want is a second sample of life. And Earth is a great place to start looking because it's cheap to look here. Uh, <laughs> Mar Mars is another uh, good place to look, but it's expensive to get there. And there's a problem also. Because, as Chris alluded to, um, the Earth and Mars trade rocks. Uh, so we have two Mars rocks right here at Arizona State University. So we know that material is swapped between these planets. And it seems very likely that microbes can hitch a ride in that material. Uh, the rocks, incidentally, get off Mars by, because Mars gets hit from time to time by an asteroid or a comet with enough force to splatter rocks around the solar system. So we know that there's a traffic of material between the two. It seems very likely if you have life on one, you'll get it on the other. So we may go to all the expense of going to Mars, find this life there, but oh, it just turns out to be another branch on the same tree of, li of life as us. So it doesn't, you, you might find a different form of life on Mars, but you might find it on Earth as well. That's my point. Can I address, you said a definition of life. I have had a stab at a definition of life because for me, the most important thing is about the information processing capabilities, because I know of nothing other than life or the products of life, like computers, that process what we might call semantic or contextual information. Uh, so uh, th that, that, to me, seems to get closest to the heart of what is really weird about life. So does anybody here want to speak to the notion of artificial life? I'm thinking about Chris Langton now, or Tom Ray's Tierra, and so on. Life within, do you want to go talk about that, Lawrence, the life in the computer? Artificial life, you mean? As artificial called. life, you mean? Computer life. What I just said, computer life? I mean, I think it will share many characteristics. I, I think the difference is, but I don't expect it to be long. I mean, Craig has said for a long time the difference, I mean, he's doing software that makes its own hardware. And the difference with computer software is it doesn't do it yet. But once I think computers become self-aware, and once they can actually create the hardware, that they'll certainly become the dominant forms of li intelligent life on the planet, I suspect. And then, in fact, biology will have to incorporate that in order to keep up. But that's, uh, that's in the future, 10 or 20 years at least. And, um, <laughs> but, but I would, I just want, you know, so I think that it's hard to know. I don't know if Craig wants to add to it, but I, I would also say, I guess because of what Paul said, that the big, it would be a bigger surprise, and you talked about looking for life on Mars, but it would be a bigger surprise to go to Mars and find it wasn't our cousins, just because the planets have polluted each other. And it would be very, stuff from Earth has gone there, although it's harder, and stuff from there has come here. So if life can easily survive the voyage, which microbial life can, it'd be amazing to discover life on Mars that wasn't our cousin, I think. So, so does anybody have a, p a perspective on the directed panspermia hypothesis that Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel did? I mean, it, I mean where, did, where did life begin on Earth? I mean, did it come from somewhere else? Direct. What's the general opinion at this point? Richard, do you have a thought on that? Well, I, I think that um, Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel's directed pan panspermia was largely tongue-in-cheek, but I think they, they wanted to, to make the point that if indeed, as, as at the time was thought, the origin of life on this planet was a very difficult problem, 
then you could, um, as it were, spread the problem out by saying it could happen any, anywhere else. I mean, directed panspermia, in case anyone doesn't, doesn't know, it's the idea that a civilization elsewhere in the universe tried to uh, propagate its form of life and put its form of life into the nose cone of a rocket and shot it off and it happened to land here. The universe is an awfully big place and the, and the chance of a rocket happening to hit one planet rather than just whizzing by all of them is, is pretty low. I don't think they ever thought it was a serious... Um, I, think it was, I think it was kind of tongue-in-cheek to make a point. Chris? But th I, I think... Uh, Richard's right, the directed panspermia maybe was tongue-in-cheek, but the notion that life could be ejected, like Lawrence was saying, by natural processes and spread, which is just called regular panspermia, is getting more serious attention now because as we study early life, it's looking more and more like life appears very early in Earth history at a very complete and complex level already. It, it seems like Athena springing from the head of Zeus fully formed. It's really quite a mystery and it's for some people to think, well, maybe it didn't develop here. It came here and landed here. And that's why we get this impression of incredible development and complexity so early. Is, uh, is Brittany Fox here anywhere? Okay, so she, she sent a question in on the, on the Facebook, Twitter, or Origins Project website. I, I think this probably goes to Craig, but other people might want to comment as well. Ethically speaking, do you believe that life should be created in the laboratory, laboratory, and more importantly, do you believe that life can, in fact, be created in laboratory set setting? That's easy, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, in fact, there's, a, there, there's an interesting, uh, being Darwin's birthday, there's an interesting quote uh, in his book about that it would be uh, much more interesting, I, I don't, I'd have to paraphrase it because I, I didn't bring it with me, much more interesting to, to study uh, uh, man-made variations of species than what occurs naturally, uh, something to that uh, extent, uh, because what he was finding, I guess, in England was pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> but Craig, you've got a long way to go before you make all of life from scratch. You can make the, the, the genome part, that's the easy part, but all the other stuff, it's going to take a while, isn't it? Well, it wasn't so easy, actually. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, easy with hindsight. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it remains to be seen. I, I think the, uh, you know, we, I mean, we have to cheat to some extent uh, because if we put the components in that can read the DNA, uh, make the proteins, the ribosome is one of the most complex structures uh, we have. And, and so just starting with the ribosome is sort of like building a new Ferrari and buying the engine from uh, somebody else. Uh, but sooner or later, these uh, simple information systems will get read. I mean, it, it is important, and we are discussing this at the, uh, at the break, is what, how much information transfers with the cell. Uh, obviously, in terms of uh, our species, quite a bit transfers uh, with the cell. The, uh, uh, the mitochondria, the mitochondrial DNA is always just a, a maternal uh, lineage. Uh, I think microbes are a lot simpler, and I think we will be able to totally create cellular systems from non-cellular systems and from synthetic molecules and synthetic DNA. That's still a very long way from creating life from scratch. Right. Uh, right. Could, Craig, do, we, uh, do you know from your work whether, what, the, what the minimum, do we yet know what the minimal configuration is to make life? Y you mean the minimal gene set? The, the minimal gene set. Uh, we're, we're whittling down on it, but there won't be a minimal gene set. Uh, there'll be multiple ones because I, I'm not so sanguine as some of my colleagues here that there's only one life form on this planet. Uh, we have a lot of different types of metabolism, uh, different organisms. Uh, I wouldn't call you the same life form as the one we have that lives in pH 12 base that would dissolve your skin uh, if we dropped you in it. Oh, I've got the same genetic code. We'll have a common ancestor. You, you, well, you don't have the same genetic code. In fact, the mycoplasmas use a different genetic code and would bit. not work in, uh, in your cells. So there, there are a lot of variations on the but you're, But you're not saying it belongs to a different tree of life from me, are you? Well, I think the tree of life is an artifact of... Uh, some early scientific studies that aren't really holding up. So the, the tree, uh, you know, there, there may be a bush of life. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, yes. Uh, bush. A tree. I don't like that word. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, oh, but that's only in. Texas. All right. I can see uh, that point. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so there is not a tree of life. And right. in fact, from our deep sequencing of organisms in the ocean, out of now we have about 60 million uh, different uh, uh, unique gene sets, uh, we found 12 that look like a very, very deep branching, perhaps fourth domain of life. Uh, that obviously is extremely rare that it only shows up out of those few sequences. But it's still DNA based. Uh, but you know, the diversity we have in the DNA world, I, I'm not so sanguine and ready, ready to throw out the DNA world. I think we're going to, maybe uh, like Richard was saying, we're going to find the same uh, molecules and the same base systems wherever we look. You, in fact, had a comment you wanted to make, Richard, I think. Well, it, it's rather moved on. I'm, I mean, I was just going to say I can't imagine why anyone should think it was an ethical problem. I could see why they might think it was a, a problem of expediency. You might, you might fear that it would, you know, escape and overrun the world or something, but, but ethical problem, I, I can't see. Well, but I'm now intrigued by Craig saying that he... Little. I, I, I'm in, intrigued at Craig saying that, he, that the tree of life is a fiction. I, I mean, the, the DNA code of all creatures that have ever been looked at is all but identical. And um, surely that means that they're all related, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look, let me give you a specific question here. This is from somebody called Gus Holward, a filmmaker, who sent something onto the website, I think. If we could fully understand the origins of life, consciousness, etc., etc., do you believe that that type of discovery would help strip away some of the enamel of religious and metaphysics? Or do you think that, like the Big Bang and other complex cosmological concepts of which we now have a deep understanding, it would simply fly over the heads of the masses and possibly further the gap between science and religion? It sounds like a Dawkins question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it obviously ought to have the effect that the questioner uh, says. Whether it actually would, I'm in rather inclined to be pessimistic as he, as he is. I suspect that, that it wouldn't, no matter how fully you prove something, those people who are indoctrinated from childhood in their religion would never, ever give it up. I Sadly. Yeah, I think... Let, let me, I, I think let me expand on that. I think we're already hearing. I, I think that we, we already, uh, both of us are probably, I don't know if you've ever been, but I've been to the Pontifical Academy in the Vatican and, 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 and for meetings, and they're already preparing to discover life elsewhere and incorporate it in, in, in Catholic theology, I think. And so I think that the, uh, I'm serious, I, I, because it's going to happen, and, and, I, and, 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 and they've learned the hard way. Um, uh, <laughs> And so I think I think uh, it's very um, it's very diff it, it will it will ch for a lot of people it will confront their notions. But I think it's I agree with with uh, Richard completely uh, that that I think it's unlikely that that alone is gonna is gonna strip people of beliefs that um, that they already have based on on well I won't go on. <laughs> Do you have trouble convincing people, um, Chris, that, that, that given all the issues that there are on the planet and given the fact that we know so little about all forms of life on this planet, that we should still be lurching off in search of life in other directions? Well, I think, it's, I think it is important to answer the question, why should we search for life on other worlds? And that's what I opened with, and I think it's important to have that question both for us as scientists, but also to answer the general public. Why should we be spending a lot of money to search for life on Mars? And again, I go back to the fundamental scientific importance that might be derived by having a second biochemistry. I side with Richard on this and not with Craig Venter. That I think there is only one type of life on Earth, one. And if we had two, that would be a lot more. There's only one we know about. Yeah, there's only one we know. Paul is right. right. right there's right. only one we know. And I'm all with Paul. If we can find two right here on Earth, that's good. But uh, I want to go to Mars anyway, so while I'm there, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to look for life there. So, so here's a question from somebody. Do you believe uh, Omoni Abu 
ASU student, do you believe that in the future there could be life on Mars or any other planets in our solar system? There could be in the future, for sure. Yeah, I think Mars will inevitably be a biological world. It may be a biological world and populated by organisms with a Martian genome, or failing that, it will be a biological world populated by organisms with an Earth genome. Earth will share its genome. It will be the gift from Earth. So, so this is the cover of the current Skeptic magazine, and the, the main story is the origin of life. Um, this is New Scientist, um, yeah. just two, 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 three days ago. There's a long piece in here on um, uh, chemical creation uh, of, of life. Um, so the life factory, inanimate matter that can evolve before our eyes could point to exotic new life forms. Um, why did you choose this, this particular subject? I mean, it seems to be quite hot at the moment. Sir. Well, it's, I, I tried to illuminate some of the ideas in my introduction. The point is that it, it's hard to imagine anything that touches us more deeply, a question, an origins question that, that, that is more direct than the origin of life on Earth and, and our own origins. And, uh, and also, because as we're learning at the meeting we're having now, there are tremendous developments that are, are potentially not only um, changing our picture of our understanding of the origin of life, but likely to do it in the near future. And I, and I generally think it's that fortune favors the prepared mind. And these kind of discussions are very important because if we're going, if they're going to create life in the laboratory, it's really important for people to understand the potential and what to worry about and what not to worry about. And, and so, uh, uh, and, and finally, because, uh, I, well, I was going to say it later, but I'll say it now, I think the, the, the true value of science uh, and art and literature is to, change, is to change our picture of our place in the cosmos. That's why, that's what makes be, being human worth being human. And, and that unifying aspect of trying to understand the origin of life really will ultimately change our understanding of ourselves. So it seemed to me a, a profound issue, and it was also a fun one. Yeah. So that was the I other. interrupted you. You had some other question. You were just yeah, going. I was going to disagree with Paul. I, I, in fact, I'll make him a bet right now. Yes, um, I'll hold the... And, you, and, and I don't trust Chris to hold... <laughs> Richard, I trust to hold it. But uh, um, the, the, uh, uh, I, I suspect, in, not only in a decade, that we won't find a second generation no, 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 life on no. Earth. What I said was, if it's there, okay. if there is a, a, a second form of life on okay. Earth, we could find it in 10 years. So okay. Because oh, okay. it may not be there. Yeah, no, I was going to say that in the next, uh, next century, which is good because neither of us will collect, right, that we right, won't right, find yeah. any evidence for a second right, genesis. Right. And the reason <clears> being... Twofold. One, at this meeting, I've, got, I've become more and more convinced that maybe the mechanisms that have led to life have a reason. It's not just random, that, that DNA and RNA have the structure they do, and including the set of amino acids they do, for a real chemical and thermodynamic reason. So I'm beginning to think so, that it may have been driven in that direction. But the other argument is that, you know, evolution says that successful forms rule out other forms. And, the kind of life we know has been pretty successful, and I suspect it'd be pretty hard to find a niche, as far as we could tell, that even in, in the kind of life that you're talking about that lives in acid levels that would dissolve us is from the same tree of life, and life seems to have occupied every niche on the planet it could have, the kind of life that we have, and therefore I suspect that even if there was another life form, it would have been crowded right. out by now. Those yeah. are the two well, Darwin no, said no, it I would have been I eaten. I disagree with that. Um, Darwin said it would have been eaten. By, by yeah. us, I mean, yeah. not yeah. by us, but by But us. not if it, only if it's tasty, you see, and so if it's got radically different biochemistry, uh, it's, yeah. you know, and the, and the left-right is a very good example of that. They could uh, peacefully coexist. Uh, but but you're right that life as we know it is spread into a wide geographical and parameter space, but it doesn't fill it out totally. Yeah. Uh, and this idea that you couldn't, you know, one form has to eliminate the other. The archaea and the bacteria uh, have coexisted peacefully for what, two and a half billion years, three billion, I don't, I don't know. Do you three know, half, Craig, how, how far back for, to the branch? 3.5 billion. Oh, three yeah, 3.5 billion. 3.5 billion, billion. Um, billion was old as far. And, uh, you know, in many ways they're in competition for resources. And it's true that if you look at the distribution of, of microorganisms, some are, are, are present in large abundance and others in small abundance, but they can, th th this remains a stable distribution. I see no reason why one would have to squeeze the other out. Let me ask a, a, a practical question. Um, it, it's fun to talk about this. It's great that all the research is going on. In terms of practical applications of this, this kind of thinking, I've 
thinking more along the lines of, of what you're doing, Craig, now in terms of synthetic organisms. I mean, could you speak to the environmental impact of those sorts of things? Well, part of what's driving it is, uh, you know, other than these basic questions, is trying to find some alternate chemistries that will allow us to live on this planet a little bit longer. So we're, we're trying to see if we can use carbon dioxide as the, the main starting ingredient for all future food and fuel. Uh, it is now for food, but it's a very inefficient process through plants and photosynthesis uh, versus scaling that up through deliberate genetic engineering. And so if we can use CO2 and make hydrocarbons that can go into the ExxonMobil refineries, instead of taking that carbon out of the ground, we can eventually start to shift that equilibrium. But we have some real practical problems. And the example I give is, uh, I, I was born in 1946, and there, there's now over three people on the planet for everybody that existed the year I was born. That we wouldn't have needed the size auditorium uh, uh, <laughs> 64 years ago. Uh, and in 30 years or less, uh, there's going to be just shy of 10 billion people. Uh, we can't provide food, fuel, medicine, clean water very efficiently for the close to 7 billion people we have now. Uh, so we need some new solutions. And uh, uh, people have been looking at naturally occurring organisms. People have studied algae for almost a century now, thinking it would provide these solutions. But Algae don't exist naturally to produce these incredibly high uh, concentrations of, of the specific molecules that are needed. But it's not hard in the laboratory to change things a million fold uh, synthetically uh, and actually design organisms and design the future of plants uh, to do what we want them to do. So I, I think they're more than just a few practical purposes. It's our whole basic. Uh, uh, existence will depend on these and other types of scientific breakthroughs. Yeah. Lee, um, Lee Hartwell, uh, in terms of, I mean, your primary focus is on, is, is on cancer and so on, but, but in that you're looking at the commonalities, the, the, the um, conservation of um, information from organisms from yeast to, to humans and so on. Did what you, what you learned in doing, in doing the research uh, give you a different perspective on this question of what is life? On the perspective of what question? On, on the perspective of, of, of life and its, its value. Well, we all value life. <laughs> uh, but uh, with respect to the question of the origin, um, uh, it, uh, I find it just um, uh, that the more we learn about cells, the, the more complex they seem. They're just incredibly complex things. And um, to, you know, go from what we can see today to try to reason where it came from, I think is really impossible. Um, Seth, have you had any thoughts on, on where your work is, how it impacts this particular discussion? No, I don't have anything to say about this particular discussion. <laughs> um, I do research. <laughs> Touché. Not tonight. <laughs> but, let, me, let me jump in for a second and, and sure. say that, I mean, in fact, actually it's not... It, Sid should have something to say, because we, at just in his talk today, he was talking about how trying to understand RNA actually made allow us to treat diseases in a, um, in, in a new way, by using RNA to cleave and, and destroy um, certain diseases. And I think, and, and I was surprised that Lee didn't, didn't pick up on that, that not only the, I suspect the economy of, of the world will depend on the kind of software hacking that's done with G DNA in the future, just as the present economy depends on, on, much on, on, on the ones and zeros in, in silicon. And, but I suspect at the same time as the economy that, that our health in the future is going to be dramatically affected, our ability to fight disease and treat diseases by exactly these uh, questions of that, that the, the research that's being done by many of the people in, uh, at this table. I, so, yeah, it was, a, it was a clumsily asked question. What I was trying to get at was that I read somewhere where I read your Nobel Prize speech and so on that working with yeast and then seeing um, how, how similar mechanisms translated and so on and so forth gave you this wonderful sense of, of the connectedness of things, if you like. 
Uh, oh, well, that's... I wasn't trying to force lyricism yeah, into your mouth. I, I see, yeah. No, that's certainly what, what is, is, I think, um, you know, surprising, really, and maybe it shouldn't be, but I think it was, was the fact that the, the fundamental um, chemistry of life and the fundamental, you know, thousands of functions that different cell types have are, are very, very similar to one another. Um, there are extremes, but for the most part, um, all, for example, eukaryotic cells, animals, things like that, they function in very, very similar ways. And so you can take this Tinker Toy set or set of Legos uh, that arose, you know, at the dawn of certainly eukaryotic life uh, and much of it before. And, um, and, and make all kinds of things out of it. Um, and, and so what that means is that we can study, you know, study things in any system and learn things about ourselves. And, and that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. The, uh, the possibility of alternative microbial life on Earth, Paul, we did that, but, but how serious do you think? Um... Well, I'm relying on people like Craig to find it, you know, because he's going out trawling the planet. Uh, if anyone is set up to look for something seriously weird, it's got to be his outfit. You going to take on this challenge? But, but we're only sequencing DNA and RNA. So I know. If so, some, you right? Know. So you've got to keep your eyes open. But, you know, first. maybe you should say what you've done, because I, I find it fascinating what you've done with your little sailboat. Uh, not that little. but. Uh, it's just amazing with what one search is, how, much, how many new life forms have been uncovered. I don't know if it's clear to people. Yeah. It, it, we've lost count, uh, basically, because there, there's so much diversity in the oceans. But what we haven't published yet is we've been sampling very deep in the Earth, um, down to about this 120 degree uh, Celsius right. barrier. And how many kilometers is that? Uh, well, you can go down, depending on where you are, a mile to two miles. You prefer uh, miles, deep. right. Um, it, it, and so it's, it, it's not real deep, but there, there's more life underneath uh, the surface of the Earth than there is in the oceans, or certainly equivalent, right. the right. same densities. But the organisms are very different, and there's, uh, in the ocean we find this tremendous diversity probably largely due to UV radiation. And deep in the earth, uh, we don't find the same uh, clouds of diversity around the same organisms. In fact, they uh, getting a, a sample from Colorado, okay. about a mile deep, an organism was close to being identical to one from a volcano in Italy. Uh, so maybe without UV radiation, without all these things that drive mutations, uh, life is a lot more stable, and, and so we have uh, we haven't looked for non-DNA, non-RNA life. But when you're isolating cellular life, there is nothing that shows up that's not in that category. Well, how, but how would you know? Because we do cell sorting down to the single cell level, and you never and, see when you test for DNA. And we can sequence a genome from a single bacterial cell. Ah, yeah, but you see, if you tried to sequence one, even that had a di different genetic code, you wouldn't make any progress, would you? You'd move on to the next but, but one. But this is like trying to prove there's no God. No, 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 it's not. No, no, no it's the real no, question. No, so for example, you can stain for DNA, I'm okay? To Richard back in the argument. <laughs> well, no, but, but I'm trying to put a research project here, you see. You can stain for, for DNA, is that right? But you can't stain for no DNA. Ah, but if you see, a, a, you know, a population of microorganisms and only a third of them are staining for DNA, you think, well, what are the other two-thirds? They all have DNA in them. All the ones you've looked at or so maybe, far. Maybe there's some invisible ones that we're not no, seeing. No, no, right? no, no, no. You're not taking this seriously. You don't see them because the way you see them is by staining their DNA. Right. We sort them down to single cells in the cell sorter, and we can grow them up from single cells. Right. We can do the genome. You, you can grow cells. them uh, in a standard uh, cell culture, but if they were radically alternative organisms, they wouldn't grow, and so you throw them away. It's self-selecting. If you go looking for A, you will find A. You won't find B. I want you to look for B. I'm going to take this bet and say you're not going to find anything in the next 10 years. Well, not if you don't put your heart in it. <laughs> 
let, 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 me, let, me ask, let me ask a question to everyone here who I want to hear the answer to. I'm, I'm going to ask it so I don't have to answer it. Um, do you think in, in, in your lifetime, and that varies, um, uh, uh, that we will know the, the origin of life on Earth, what, uh, the step by which non-life became life on Earth? Do you think we'll answer that question while you're alive? Start with Richard, maybe, and move down. Uh, I'm increasingly optimistic, having attended uh, the day's conference uh, that you organized, Lawrence. I, I, I had hitherto thought of it as a rather r remote possibility, but um, things seem to be really moving in an exci exciting way, as far as I can understand it. So yes, I think, I think it will. Sid? I think it's quite possible. The question is, as you said, how long are we going to live <laughs> as individuals? <laughs> and I don't expect to live that long. <laughs> Uh, but I think it's, it's very hard to make predictions about the future, as Yogi Berra said. But perhaps in 20 years we might understand something about the real origin of life. Uh, <clears throat> I, I know you want to go down uh, this sequence, but I have another question for you, which maybe uh, we can come to after Lee oh. speaks. No, go ahead. I don't have anything to say on this subject. Well, okay. Why don't we go? Why don't we go? Why don't we go through no, here, no, and then no, you can no, ask your no, question. No, no, no. I want to ask you the question. Oh, you want to ask me a question? Yes. Okay. Well, well, before you change the topic, uh, you know, I, I disagree. We're not going to know the origin of life on this planet. We're generating hypotheses, and the only way to test those is to see if we can recreate those conditions and that origin on another planet, or witness that it did take place. You know. There's some things we can do in science in terms of proving uh, certain things about life we discover. Guessing what happened uh, 4.2 billion years ago or 3.5 billion years ago, we can come up with a lot of good guesses. There's been a lot of good guesses floating around. It, it, it's impossible to prove it. I, I have to really disagree there in the sense that, because I think it's part of the problem, partly of science and religion too, is that people have the wrong impression of what science is. That science tells a story, and it's a story like any other story. But, it make, but the difference is it's a story that makes predictions. So you can, you, can make, you can try and guess what happened in the past, but there's sometimes, based on those guesses, that you can make predictions about things you haven't measured yet. Say, if life formed this way, then I can do this experiment in the lab and observe something I haven't yet seen. And if I do that enough, and if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, and all my predictions are consistent with what I see, then I can say that I'm not post-dicting, I'm predicting. No, but then Paul would say well, you didn't look for the other life <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, uh, Craig, I think uh, I, I agree Craig, Craig, that I, uh, we're unlikely. I, I don't uh, disagree yes. with anything you said in, in terms of your last few statements. You're absolutely right about the things you said. Uh, but I think it's possible, again, from material we heard earlier today and what I know other scientists are doing, who are interested in this topic, that we might have some information, put it that way, about the origin of whatever we call the origin of life 20 years from now or something, something like that. I, I w certainly won't. I agree I with that. Yeah, I certainly won't say anything with certainty. There, there is another question, Lawrence, which I would like to ask you, which has nothing to do with what we were just talking about. Okay. You were talking about the future of computers and that they will have consciousness, which I don't understand at all. I don't understand what you mean by consciousness, but we don't have yeah. to talk about that right now. And knowing that you're a very erudite person, and that you've probably read some of Isaac Asimov. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Shouldn't we make sure that the three laws of robotics are imposed on our computers? <laughs> no, I, I, actually, I don't. I, and it always amazes me, and I'll bring in Star Trek because I'm contractually obliged, uh, uh, to, to, um, that we have this perception that somehow um, alien life, be it computer life, is always a threat. And that, in fact, that, that um, our future isn't, isn't, isn't their future. And so the, the part of the problem of, the, of, the, of Asimov's free laws is the assumption that doing away with humans is a bad thing. And, uh, and it's not at all clear to me that that's a bad thing in the long term. That because I doubt, in, I doubt, 200 years from now, that what that being human will will have that much resemblance to what being human is now. And, and, and no matter what, whether we're computers get 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 uh, 
get intelligent or not. I suspect with what we'll be able to do in genetics, no, 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 no. that the definition you of could humanity say the same will thing, You could say the same thing about Benjamin Franklin, that he would have had no idea of what our life is like today. But I think that's partly But he wrong. didn't have the technology, no, and we don't no, have the no, technology. No, no, no. We'll Benjamin have a... Franklin would understand what life is today, even though he wouldn't recognize it easily. And we will understand what life is like 200 years from now, even though it might be difficult. Oh, yeah, but, it, it, but being a so, human may be very different. Then what, it may have very little resemblance to what, what being human is today. And, I'm will, and that doesn't seem to be, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It just seems to me that what's possible is going to happen. And there's no sense trying to avoid it. Well, I don't understand what you mean by what is possible and, and what we can or cannot recognize. I, but I, we, we'll talk about okay. this later. Do, do any of you, um, have any of you had any um, sympathy at all for the, the, the Gaia hypothesis that Jim Lovelock and Lynn Margulis put out some years ago, the notion of, the, of the, the, the Earth itself or the biosphere at least being a living organism? None. None. No sympathy. <laughs> I didn't think you would. But I thought... I thought <laughs> you, nobody subscribes to that at all? No, Richard oh. agrees with me. <laughs> in, in the, in you the can week. ask, he's much, he's much more eloquent than I am. In the weak sense, life has yeah. changed Earth. In I mean, as sense. I said, oxygen exists in the atmosphere right. only because of life. Yeah. So life is intimately connected. And if, as we learned in our meeting today, and geology is intimately connected with life. We've learned that, that, that the geological features of the Earth, in fact, dramatic, no doubt dramatically affected the way life evolved. So there's an intimate connection between life and the planet, but some kind of cosmic... Um, New age thing, I'm not a big fan of. No. Well, I want to defend uh, Lovelock here for a minute. Uh, his real insight was that the cycling of the light elements on Earth, carbon and nitrogen, sulfur and phosphorus, were dominated and really controlled by biology. And he derived that insight when NASA asked him to be part of the search for life on Mars. He looked at Mars and saw a planet in which the elements were not cycled by biological systems, and he said the big difference between Earth and Mars is on Earth, the light elements are under biological control, and on Mars they're not. And that is a very important concept for how to search for life. And it, now, effectively, that's how we will search for life around planets or on other stars, because of this effect that life will have in altering the environment, creating, for example, oxygen. And that oxygen on Earth is the sheer, is the simplest and most straightforward manifestation of Lovelock's idea. Now, it, it has evolved into this quasi-mystical uh, Mother Earth sort of thing, but I think the root of it is solid science, and it's got to do with the fact that when life is present on a world, it takes over the whole world, and it is in command of the cycling of the light elements. And I think that's operationally a very important concept when we look at other but worlds. The, but, but, I mean, th that's what Lawrence more or less said, that, that it, nobody doubts that the presence of life on a planet changes the conditions on that planet. What Lovelock said was that the, the Earth is a living system which actually regulates itself for its own good. I mean, that, that's a very much more radical thing. And Lovelock himself never said this, but John Maynard Smith told a wonderful story of how he was at a conference where there was a, an, one of those philosophical ecologists. His name was Goldsmith. Um, you know who I mean, Roger? Um, oh, Samuel Goldsmith. Or Teddy. Teddy, Teddy, Goldsmith. Teddy, Teddy, Teddy Goldsmith. Yes, I met Teddy. Um, and um, they were discussing um, whether it was discussing the theory that a meteorite had hit the Earth and destroyed the dinosaurs and, you know, major, major catastrophe. And Teddy Goldsmith said, impossible. Gaia would never have permitted it. <laughs> well, anything can be taken too far. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you're, you're, the, the, you're, there's, a, there's an extract from um, some of your writings in, in this uh, compendium I've been talking about. It's the universal Darwinism thing, and it, since we are on February the 12th and Darwin's birthday. Um, do you, do you, would you just sort of explain this a little bit? You actually think this principle is absolutely universal, well, right? I conjectured, I conjectured that if there is life anywhere else in the universe, however weird and however alien and however strange it may be, the one thing I would put my shirt on is that it will be Darwinian life. Are you going to hold this bed as well? I mean, I, I'll agree with him that it will evolve. 
But uh, the question I would put back is, is Darwinian evolution the only way right, to evolve? Right. Well, that's a question, not a statement. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. It's certainly the only way that's ever been proposed that would work. Now, there may be other ways that haven't been proposed, but the only other sort of candidate would be Lamarckian evolution, and that, in principle, couldn't work, even if the facts supported it. Well, on that Darwinian note, I, um, I'm I instructed that we should bring it to a close and thank the panelists very much. Well, we, well I want to thank the panelists, but I do want to, I want to thank everyone uh, for, for, and, and all of you for, for coming. And I, I do want to just say that um, this event is part of a continuing series, and there's three, there's three events I wanted to let you know about in the future. One's related to an event Paul is organizing, which is related to this. It's about life in this and other universes, I think. And it's... Uh, life's destiny. Life's destiny. In, in this universe, universe and others. Uh, Lord Martin Rees, who's... Um, among any other things, the astronomer Royale is going to be talking April 14th here. Associated with the alien thing we talked about, Lucy Hawking is here, and she's coordinating with Paul a contest for high schools, for students, to, um, to suggest what they would say in response to a message from aliens that we receive in SETI to give Paul advice. And we hope to announce the winner of that contest at the next Origin event, which will be, as I've announced before, a major four-day Festival of Science and Culture, April 8th to 11th, involving uh, theater, music, film, and dance, with some rather spectacular um, events. So uh, I'm not going to go into them here, but look out for them. And I think the reason I want to end with that is that, that the questions we've talked about, as I say, are not just scientific ones, they're cultural ones, and in my opinion, they're ones we should all be asking and be prepared to answer. But thank you very much for coming, and thanks to the panelists as well.